thank you, thank you, Van, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here to uh, give this talk. Um, um, my recent work on um, uh, entanglement entropy in theory is due to high derivative gravity. Um, so, as we all know, uh, entanglement is um, a, basically a measure of quantum correlations. Uh, if we have any quantum system where we can divide the Hilbert space into two subsystems, say A and A bar, then we can uh, trace over the degrees of freedom in A bar and get a reduced density matrix for A. And the entanglement entropy is uh, simply the Van Neumann entropy associated with this density matrix. And this is very simple. Um, it has been a useful and important um, idea uh, in a lot of um, topics recently, uh, in particular in quantum information this entanglement entropy is a fundamental tool for uh, error corrections and communications. In quantum field theory, uh, this idea of entanglement entropy, it, could, it leads to a monotonic C function under the RG flow um, because it naturally satisfies an inequality called the not strong subadditivity. And in condensed matter physics, it is a, a non-local order parameter for some of the very interesting phases that people talk about. Um, and one of the most interesting uses of entanglement entropy uh, seems to be related to how we understand quantum gravity. Um, because as we understand it, quantum gravity is likely to involve information processing at, a some, at some fundamental level. Uh, there, in particular, there, there's, there are there, there's a lot of tantalizing evidence uh, that uh, there could be a deep connection between space-time and entanglement. Um, uh, for example, one of the ideas being um, that by studying entanglement and understanding entanglement entropy better, we can perhaps understand how space-time emerges in a theory of quantum gravity um, or even derive ADS CFT. Um, this could be important because ultimately we want to go beyond perhaps ADS CFT and generalize that to, say, cosmology. And understanding, um, understanding or deriving ADS CFT in, in, a, in a different way would be tremendously helpful, uh, at least for that purpose. Um, entanglement entropy also comes into the current debate about. Uh, black hole complementarity versus firewall, um, but I'm not going to say much of in this talk. Um, I'm going to focus on the holographic entanglement entropy, which is um, a really a field theory quantity that is completely concretely defined, um, but is geometrized by the holographic tool. So let's um, first review how that is done in Einstein gravity. Uh, root -Nagi uh, the root Takanagi formula was proposed in 2006. Uh, is a, it is a remarkably simple formula uh, for entanglement entropy in field theories due to Einstein gravity. The prescription is uh, very simple. If we want to compute the entanglement entropy for region A on the field theory side, we simply construct a minimal surface that uh, shares the same boundary as the boundary of A. Um, but can extend into the bulk, and the entanglement, entanglement entropy is then given by the area of this minimal surface divided by 4 G Newton. This is an uh, important, um, uh, important result uh, for two different reasons. One is um, that entanglement entropy is usually a complicated quantity to compute in a generic quantum field theory or for a generic choice of the subsystem A. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be numerically computed, but, rel uh, but, but analytic results are rare, at least. Um, and, um, and in a strongly coupled field theory, we simply, it's simply out of uh, a lot of numerical or analytic control. But this formula tells us that, that in a holographic theory, there is a very easy way to proceed, which is to compute some classical geometric data in the bulk. And this is much, much, much easier to computing some density matrix and taking the log and then the trace. 
Um, so this is the practical reason for why it's interesting. It's also conceptually interesting because once we, one might think that if we understand all, all these entanglement entropies for, re, for arbitrary regions, um, then we can hope to reconstruct the bulk metric and even reconstruct the bulk. Um, so it is very tantalizing to use this idea to see how the, how the bulk space is, is, is um, derived from ADS-CFT. Um, it has, uh, recent years it has been, especially this year has seen a lot of progress in understanding this simple formula. It was uh, first noticed that this trivially satisfied strong submittivity or consistent check um, and also it recovers um, exact results that we know for a single interval in one plus one dimensional CFT. In this case, the entanglement entropy is completely fixed by the conformal symmetry. Um, it was first derived for a special case, which is when the boundary of A is a sphere. Um, it was derived by Myers, Cassini, and Huata, where they noticed that there's a U1 symmetry that allows one to transform the problem of computing the entanglement entropy into the problem of computing a black hole entropy for a certain topological black hole in, the, in ADS. And earlier this year, it was proven for one plus one dimensional CFTs in general. Uh, in, by, by in general, I mean two or more we can consider arbitrary number of disjoint intervals um, uh, using either field, theori field theoretic techniques um, uh, in terms of conformal blocks or by using gauge gravity duality. And perhaps uh, quite remarkably, um, it was also derived generally for arbitra in arbitrary dimensions for Einstein gravity by um, Eitan Lukovic and Juan Madesena uh, this April. Um, and going beyond this formula, one can consider one loop corrections in the bulk. Uh, as we know, this formula is, um, is a large n result. It is a leading result in the large n limit. And one can ask what is the leading correct one over n corrections to that. And this, is the, this can be done in certain cases by computing one loop corrections in the bulk. Uh, in particular, we did that for the 2D CFT case. Um, and also, one can, um, uh, there's a proposal of, uh, of high spin, of, of, of in holographic entanglement entropy uh, for the case of high spin gravity <coughs> by Nabil here and other people, uh, where the proposal is um, in terms of, instead of computing the minimal surface and its area, you simply compute a Wilson line which is a gauge invariant quantity. So that's a very natural generalization in that case. Um, it is very um, natural now to generalize this formula to the case of high derivative gravity. Uh, by that I mean, for example, contractions of Riemann tensors in the Lagrangian <coughs> the bulk. This is important, um, at least for the following reason. Uh, for a practical reason, at least, we can imagine that we want to use gauge gravity duality to study a lot of CFTs. And um, Einstein gravity is not, is only, it's always to give us, um, uh, so for example, let's consider 4D CFTs. 4D CFTs can in general have two central charges, A and C. Einstein gravity gives A equals C um, in a large N limit. Um, but if we want to get some field theory where A and C, the two, the two central charges are different, we can include high derivative terms in the Lagrangian. So this is at least um, to have a more generic um, uh, possible field theory, um, one needs to include this, uh, this corrections in the bulk. Uh, these are alpha prime corrections in string theory. So string theory already tells us that these are there. So it's important uh, to, cons to, have, to have some formula which captures these corrections. And one might think that we should be looking for something which replaces <coughs> the area in the Ruta Kyanagi formula. This is rather analogous to how the Bekenstein Hawking entropy in the case of black hole is generalized to the Ward entropy in the case of high derivative gravity, where the Ward formula is simply 
that you take the Lagrangian, take a single derivative with respect to the Riemann tensor, contract it with the epsilon tensor where this epsilon is defined in the following way. Um, so remember this entropy formula is evaluated on the black hole horizon. The horizon is a co-dimension two surface. So there, it has two orthogonal directions. Epsilon is defined to be the epsilon tensor in those two orthogonal directions and to be zero in all other directions. So this is a very nice formula. It was proposed by Ward in 93. Um, for, for the, this is for black hole entropy. For entanglement entropy, we actually have two independent, sort of independent questions. One is, what is the formula that gives the entropy? And second, can we find the analog of the minimal surface by minimizing, for example, the entanglement entropy, by minimizing the same formula? So I'll, 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 I'll talk about both questions in sequence. Um, we know, so from, I, I review what we currently know already from literature. Um, in, we know that in general, the Ward entropy alone cannot be the entanglement entropy. Yes? Uh, we know it cannot be the entanglement entropy because it does not produce, in general, the right universal terms in the entanglement entropy. And uh, actually, for the black hole case, you might think what entropy is the most general, most most natural candidate for 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 the entropy, but there's actually a different formula uh, due to Jacobson Myers in '93, um, and the formula was that is valid for Lovelock gravity, a particular class of higher derivative gravity. Um, they, these two formulas are different, but they're only different by terms that involve the extrinsic curvature. So in the context where they were derived, where they were both derived, um, the, uh, the horizon was a killing horizon, and the difference is zero. So actually, they are agree. Uh, however, when we compute entanglement entropy, in general, the minimal surface or the analog of the minimal surface do not have <coughs> vanishing extrinsic curvature. And therefore, um, we, have, we need a prescription for those terms, at least. Um, and also, um, uh, these people found that for Gauss-Minet gravity, which is Lovelock theory at four derivatives, the Jacobson-Myers entropy seems to at least pass consistency checks. It gives the right universal terms. So it, uh, it was uh, at least um, uh, could, it could be the right answer. It could be the right um, uh, prescription for the extrinsic curvature terms. So the main result of, of my talk is to propose the following general formula. Um, the formula is, is, a, is a little bit more complicated than Watt's formula. It's, we, uh, at this stage, uh, uh, instead of going through the detailed notations, I just say that the first term is the Ward, is exactly the Ward formula for, for black hole entropy, and second terms are uh, terms that involve extrinsic curvatures. And uh, in a certain sense, I'll talk about how one can think about these terms as anomaly. It, uh, it reproduces the existing results. For example, it, it does give back exactly the Jacobson Myers story, the uh, proposal for Lovelock gravity, and uh, also it has a minimization prescription, at least for three uh, non-trivial examples. I, I mentioned here that even though um, I started um, this project by thinking about mostly uh, in the entanglement entropy, this formula and its derivation uh, also applies for black hole entropy, uh, in which case the formula is simply evaluated at the horizon. So this, in, in principle, this could be a generalization of Ward's formula when a horizon is not a killing horizon. So in, one can ask very interesting questions about how this, for example, satisfies the second law and so on, which I think are very interesting questions. Um, but um, for now, I'll, I'll, uh, for, the, for the most part of the talk, I'll still talk, uh, talk about, uh, say, in the context of entanglement entropy, just for concreteness, um, there are a, a, a lot of recent developments in understanding the entanglement entropy in special cases uh, for this formula. Um, so for example, uh, people have studied uh, Gauss-Minet theory and um, uh, general, uh, gen um, 
general for derivative gravity and so on. So um, this formula reproduces these special results, uh, which is, I think, very nice. So the outline for the rest of the talk is, I'll first review the derivation of the Ruta Kanaki formula in the case of Einstein gravity, just to uh, lay the ground, the, the, the basic strategy for its generalization to high derivative case. Uh, and also I want to say it in a way that, that I think is particularly clear how, to, how we think about these analytic continuations. And um, next I'll talk about how to derive and see this formula for, for higher derivative gravity. Um, the minimization of the formula comes next, and even, uh, at the end I'll conclude. There are three examples that, that um, so this, this formula is for, general, for the general case, but whenever we talk about something uh, abstract, it's nice to have examples in mind, and these are the three examples I uh, are mostly focused on uh, throughout the talk. Remind us of Lovelock. Yeah, Lovelock gravity is, um, uh, is a particular contraction of, uh, say, P Riemann tensors. Uh, and I can write down the Lagrangian in a moment. Uh, one can use the generalized delta function to write down the Lagrangian. So um, maybe I can show that later. It's the most general uh, theory of gravity that has only two derivatives in the equation of the Yes, that's right. So the first part is uh, a review on the derivative of the root Hakyamnaki prescription for Einstein gravity. In uh, in a lot of uh, um, the majority of the uh, analytic discussions of the entanglement entropy, we usually use the replica trick. Uh, we use so we introduce the Raney entropy by defining um, it to be the trace of, log of trace of rho to the n, and then the entanglement entropy is uh, uh, n goes to one limit of of the Raney entropy. The Raney entropy is useful in the sense that at, int at integer n, it can be written in terms of partition functions. So it's uh, important to note that the entanglement entropy involves a log which cannot easily be written in terms of the partition function of some local action. But many entropy at integer n can be written like that. And the partition function is defined on a particular space called the n-fold cover. Um, uh, the construction of the n-fold cover is, is like follows. Um, you can take n copies of the original space. So l we always work in Euclidean signature. So let me first rotate to Euclidean signature and make n copies of the original space. This is a two-dimensional example. Then in the region, I want to compute the entanglement entropy. I'll cut it apart on each uh, copy, and then I'll glue them together in a cyclic way. This essentially uh, extends the range of this angular coordinate tau from 2 pi to 2 pi n. <coughs> so it goes around until it comes back only after n copies. Um, and, and, the int and if we compute the log of the partition function uh, on this n-fold cover, we can get the reigning entropy for integer n. And let's just call these n-fold cover mn, so the original space is m1. This is just a name, so I can refer to it better. Um, it doesn't, the unfold cover itself does not really make much sense to talk, uh, at non-integer n. Uh, it can only be defined for integer n. The crucial observation of, of uh, Lukowicz and Matsena is that, that the holographic dual side uh, provides a much better analytic continuation. <coughs> so uh, let's consider that. We can, so we can always, for the unfold cover as the boundary, uh, we can always build a bulk geometry as uh, uh, in the ADS-CFT description. We can, uh, we can then compute the partition function on the n-fold cover by computing the Anshao classical action on the bulk geometry. This is the prescription for ADS-CFT. So the basic idea is we can use this to compute the action, and then we <coughs> might want to analytically continue it to non-integer n, and eventually we expand in linear ordering in <coughs> minus one and extract the entanglement entropy. This procedure is uh, very complicated in general. In particular, it requires explicit knowledge about the 
partition function or on-shell action of the dual of the n-fold cover, it can be explicitly worked out in certain cases. But in general, it might be very complicated. Uh, the observation is that we don't really need these guys explicitly. If we can somehow analytically continue the bulk geometry in a certain sense, then we can just analytic then we can just analyze the um, the bulk geometry near n equals one. And we can do some sort of expansion in the geometry itself and plug in some formula and get entanglement entropy. So this is true if we can find a family of bulk configurations that interpolates between the dual of the n-fold cover to non-integer n. Yeah. Uh, so there are many examples by now where we know analytical continuation fails because if you approach from n one plus epsilon, you get some answer, and if you do n one minus epsilon, you get some other answer. So there are some simple features people have studied in the last several years. So if I take those theories, is is there a singularity in the action? Is this bulk action? I, I think. Uh, at n is equal to one. Um, I think I think in the particular case, for example, uh, Tom Faulkner studied in the in the particular case of two two plus two dimensions, uh, one can explicitly write down the result and check whether. So 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 it is true that uh, whenever we analytically continue a function which is only defined on the set of discrete numbers to. Uh, to, uh, to a set of real numbers, there's an ambiguity. One can, in principle, fix that by imposing boundary condition of, of the entanglement entropy, of, of the reigning entropy as n, as n goes to, say, plus minus i infinity. This is a formal procedure to get rid of the ambiguity. But we can ask this a question there. Whether trace raw log row equals, yeah. trace raw log row is a well-defined function, so it doesn't, there's some answer, which is the answer. Yes. So does this answer always matches this? And I, I, is, is it guaranteed to match? That's I I I, I think my answer is if the boundary condition for n goes to plus minus plus minus i infinity is is correctly imposed, then you always get the right answer. Quite complex plane, not just those two directions. Um, there could be there could be a statement about how you how how the real be is behave. I, I think the for for real part which is bounded and imaginary part go to as long as it doesn't blow it exponentially it's okay. But may, I, I think I think with the right boundary condition it is guaranteed to be the right because the analytic continuation is guaranteed to be unique. And then there is an additional assumption. It, indeed there is an additional mild assumption that this function is actually an analytic function of n. And with those two I think one can do this, but in, indeed there are uh, there are um, subtleties in both these assumptions. So right now we are actually assuming that. You're, you're saying there are examples where it's, it's demonstrably not in the analytic function. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that's true. Uh, here we are taking the assumption it is indeed an analytic analytic function. So in particular, there's nothing. There, it's, a, it, it's in some sense a statement about the entanglement spectrum, but uh, we can we can talk about that more in detail maybe so, afterwards. So you're about to tell us about specific analytic continuation that define approaches n equals one from above. Yeah. So if there were multiples, you'd be picking one specific one. So if it were just analytic up to n equals one, and then something goes weird <laughs> at n equals one, and something else happens as you approach from below, you would say the right answer is to approach from above. Yeah, but uh, the worry is there's some non analytic behavior at, say, n equals three halves. That could be an answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the worry. Uh, let's, let's, for, let's for now assume that doesn't happen. Um, um, so I think it's an interesting question to, to ask what, when those happens, in particular in the gauge gravity, do, in a holographic case. I, I don't know the answer, but. Right now, let's assume that uh, that's, uh, this is this <coughs> is an analytic function. Then uh, one can, in principle, try to do this. So this can be thought of as the assumption into the derivation of the formula. There is another fo assumption which I haven't mentioned, which is the replica symmetry. Um, so in order to proceed, we we uh, we need to make assumption make an assumption about the bulk geometry. It is a fact that the unfold cover the boundary side has a ZN symmetry, which just permutes, cyclically permutes the N copies. So tau goes to tau plus two pi. Mm -hmm. 
it is an assumption that this ZN symmetry is not spontaneously broken in the bulk. So the bulk geometry also has the symmetry. I think right now we it uh, it agrees with particular calculations. It's not clear how general this uh, this 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 assumption will hold, um, and I I would. I would also leave it as an open question to investigate more what, what this means when, uh, when it is indeed broken, for example, for the dominant saddle. So the idea is the dominant, dominant saddle point in the bulk geometry is one where uh, you have a ZN symmetry. Then with this assumption, we can consider an orbifold, which is you mod out the solution by ZN, and let me call that B hat, where B refers to the parent space. This is this is uh, this space is interesting um, because it, uh, as we will see, it uh, it it admits a nice analytic continuation. The B hat n is a space which which is good, which can make sense for arbitrary n. This is the this is the claim. So this is the orbifold because it is regular except at the fixed points of Z n. And where are the fixed points? Uh, the claim is the fixed points form a co-dimension two surface. The way we can see that is on the boundary, the fixed points are simply, uh, in this picture, is simply the two endpoints of the interval. In general, is the boundary of the region A that you pick. Mm -hmm. And um, into the, in the, if, we extend, if we extend the tau coordinate into the bulk, uh, then it's always the circle, it's always the point where the tau circle shrinks to zero size. And, and you have a, you have a co-dimension two surface so we can look at this picture. You have a co-dimension two surface which ends at the boundary of A, and these are the this should be the fixed points for the region uh, for the for the for the ZN action. Uh, in general, this 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 co-dimension two surface could be, for example, disconnected. Uh, can have um, um, can uh, for example you can have two intervals. It can be disconnected and so on. Uh, and it also is a conical defect. Uh, with a t with a with an opening angle two pi over n, the reason for that is we started with a regular space. Remember that we have to solve all equations of motion and bulk when we consider the parent space. So when, once we do an orbifold, we necessarily involve um, uh, we necessarily produce a conical space. This this uh, this uh, this orbifold help us calculate the entanglement entropy. Because we can simply construct, by construction, we can write the classical action of the parent space in terms of n times the classical action of the orbifold. This is, at the classical level, this is, this is correct. This is, so, so we are really using ADS-CFT to, to, to translate some quantum quantity into, a, into, at least in the large n limit, into some classical quantity. And then we we'll divide and conquer it. So that's the main idea. And um, it is important to note that this S of B hat, this on-shell action for the orbifold, does not include any contribution from the, from, from the conical defect. This is, uh, in particular, we should not include any Gibbons-Hawking boundary term. Uh, uh, um, um, we, sh we should not include any um, also delta function contribution from the conical defect. We should, we should simply integrate to uh, the defect, integrate, the, for example, the Einstein-Hilbert action all the way down to the, say, rho equals 0, where rho is the proper distance from the conical defect. And that's the right answer. The reason is, uh, in the parent space, this is a totally regular place. I'm not, I'm not, I should not include anything um, uh, fantastic from, from that conical defect. So uh, the prescription is, is that we have to reproduce the reigning entropy at integer n, and therefore we should also take that prescription to the right, to the, be the right prescription for the on-shell action of the orbifold. Um, it is not plausible that we can analytically continue this orbifold. Um, so re the reason we didn't analytically continue the parent space is because usually it changes topology as we change mm -hmm. n, and for example, I don't know how to talk about fractional handles and fractional topology, but B and hat always has the right, uh, um, at least, topology to, to be analytically continued 
in particular, its boundary is always a single copy of the original space. So does anything happen at angles? Can you do this for n less than one as well? Um, I I would think there is no obstruction to do that well, from That's doing that. Even more yeah, yeah. Well, it 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 has a conical it has a conical um, uh, uh, excess in that case. Yeah. Right. So one can still one can still I think one can still do that. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. So globally, locally, I don't see any problem. Globally, I don't, I'm not sure whether you can find a global. So the worry is, at some point, maybe you stop finding a global globally well-defined solution. But I, I I don't know. I don't know whether where where is the stopping point. So when you say you want to analytically continue b hat, are you basically just changing the deficit angle? Yes, correct, correct. Yes, that's right. So yeah, yes. So, thank you. Yeah, um, the deficit angle is is two pi minus two pi over n, and we can just <laughs> continuously tune that to get non-integer n. That's correct. While imposing the the usual boundary condition at infinity at a UV boundary of Vs. So so the same boundary condition there, but with uh, an addition with a conical defect of the right amount at at this surface. Um, yeah, so that's actually the, uh, what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, so there are two ways to analytically continue this <coughs> geometry, this orbifold, uh, to non-integer n. The first is what I just said, the what I call the boundary condition method. It simply imposes an additional boundary condition at a conical defect um, while preserving all the other boundary conditions and just solve all the equation of motion. Um, the boundary condition near the conical defect is, is something like this, where rho and tau are coordinates in the orthogonal directions. Epsilon is defined as 1 minus 1 over n, so the conical defect is 2 pi times epsilon, and uh, there is some transverse geometry. It's just an unconventional IR boundary condition. And we can actually work this out and justify the form of the metric by first working out um, integer n, impose the Zn symmetry. That puts a constraint on what terms are allowed in the metric in the expansion around this conical defect. And then we simply uh, uh, analytically continue that to non-integer n. So that's the right boundary condition. Uh, there's another way to think about this, which is, which, which, so, which is sometimes more intuitive, but is actually equivalent, which is we observe that we can replace the conical defect by, by a dynamical cosmic brain. The cosmic brain is, uh, is co-dimension two and solves um, and, and has the right tension to create a, the, the right conical defect. So in this case, it has a tension proportional to epsilon. So here I'm writing out the action, which is the Einstein-Hilbert action in the Euclidean, in the Euclidean signature plus a right um, uh, tension of the cosmic brain. Um, and we so simply solve all the equation of motion. Let the, um, let the brain fluctuate and back react on the geometry. The claim is at the end of the day, you're going to get the same thing as the previous um, uh, method. And, uh, and this, is, this is just a way of getting what the uh, B hat geometry is. And, and there is um, the reason uh, the reason that this works, another way to think about this is cosmic brains are straight in a certain sense. And, and once they settle down on, on where they want to be and solve all the equation of motion, you can then take the geometry, take the cosmic brain out, make n copies, and glue them together and form a regular geometry. So at integer n, this is the, this is the way to think about how this relates to the replica trick. And then we can do this for an arbitrary n. So this is this is this is very similar to how we analytically continue a function. We construct another function using another way, which is more broadly defined, and we see that it matches with the old function at the place where they overlap. Um, so where is one may ask, what is the conical defect? It it is very similar to the minimal surface already. It has the right topological uh, properties anchored at the boundary of A, um, 
And in fact, it does become the minimal surface as n goes to 1. Um, this is particularly easy to see from the cosmic brain method. In the cosmic brain method, we simply had a um, area term for the tension of the brain. And as n goes to 1, which is when epsilon goes to 0, we have a probe brain. So it does not back react on the geometry anymore to lean order in the approximation. And what it does is to settle at the minimal surface of the original geometry. So that's very uh, clear. One can also see it from the com uh, one can also see the same, same effect from the boundary condition method. In this case, we simply look at a particular component, the ZZ component of the Einstein equation, where Z is the complex coordinate in the orthogonal direction to the conical defect. The conical defect is a co-dimension two surface, and the orthogonal space is parameterized by Z and Z bar. So if we look at this component of the uh, Ricci scale, Ricci tensor, it is um, proportional. It has a, it has a potentially um, power divergent term. This is the only term that could that can be potentially divergent as you approach the conical defect, and um, it is proportional to epsilon. So um, so this is this is true at linear ordering epsilon, and and it's proportional to the trace of the extrinsic curvature. The, we expect that um, we expect that the stress tensor. So the, uh, it, uh, we, ha we we could have scalar fields and upper matter fields in the theory, but we expect the stress tensor from those matter fields to be regular. One reason for one way to see this is in the parent space, certainly everything is regular everywhere everywhere in the bulk, and in particular at a at a fixed point of the ZN symmetry. So nothing is diverging there. And we should expect that for general n, nothing is diverging also. And therefore, the only possibility for the Einstein equation to be satisfied um, as we approach uh, this conical defect is that this term has to vanish. There's no other term which can compete with this term in the equation of motion. So that means the trace of the extrinsic curvature is 0, and that's precisely the equation for a minimal surface. So that agrees with the, uh, more easy, uh, the, the more intuitive cosmic brain method. In both methods gives the minimal surface as n goes to 1. And we just have one last step to prove the rook takayanagi formula, which is we need to compute it. We can compute the, uh, we can compute the, um, we can compute the entanglement entropy by simply taking the action, the unshell action of the orbifold and expand to linear order in n minus 1 and extract the coefficient. And this is particularly easy because the variation of, um, of this unshell action to linear order in n minus 1 is mostly proportional to the equation of motion. If we try to do a first variation of the action, we get mostly the equation of motion in the bulk, plus boundary terms. But the equation of motion is satisfied at n equals 1. So it's 0. This is because we are varying away from a solution, so the linear variation, at least linear variation, is only a boundary term. And we can compute the boundary term. Uh, I won't repeat the calculation here. It's it's very it's just a very explicit calculation, and one can find one finds that it's, it's given by the area of the minimal surface as n goes to uh, the area of the conical defect as n goes to one, which is the minimal surface divided by 4g newton. So this is for Einstein gravity. And uh, in this step, as, as we will see, there is a subtlety uh, analogous to anomaly that we, when we go beyond Einstein gravity. So this completes the derivation of the root Takayanagi formula. The, and let me just summarize what's involved. We construct the conical defect geometry by using either the co boundary condition method or using the cosmic brain method. And then we look at the equation of motion um, or the brain action and fix the location of the conical defect as n goes to 1. And eventually, we calculate the variation to linear order and extract the entanglement entropy. Mm -hmm. So um, 
we can now generalize the story to high derivative gravity. In particular, I'll consider Lagrangians, which are built from contractions of Riemann tensors. Um, and the formula is, as I said before, it's the Watt formula plus anomaly plus terms which involve extrinsic curvatures. Um, so this term, this involves the z and z bar coordinate I defined earlier. One can write it in a more covariant but more lengthy way in terms of um, project, project operator, projection operators to the co-dimension to, 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 the, to the orthogonal uh, z and z bar directions and epsilon tensors in those directions. These, this is just the pro projection which imposes the z, i, z, j, z bar, k, z bar, l kind of structure. Here, i and j are coordinates along the, along the conical defect. So, so, so this is just the same as this. Let's first ask, let's first consider, let's first ask why is there a term which I call the anomaly? Um, it's, it's simplest to use, to, to look at the, no, the first non-trivial example, which is the contractions of two Riemann tensors. <coughs> there is a term in this Lagrangian which goes as we, this, this, there is a term which is the ZIZJ component, which is potentially diverging. This is the same component we looked at a little bit earlier. It is, it, 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 is, uh, it, is it goes like epsilon over Z times the extrinsic curvature. So if we have two of these guys in the Lagrangian, we potentially construct something which is, which, which is second order in epsilon, uh, but also uh, blows up as uh, 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 as one over rho squared, where rho is the um, absolute value of z. So one might think that this term is not important because we are doing the linear variation in epsilon. Uh, remember, epsilon is linearly the same as n minus one. So so this term we would maybe naively say that we should throw it out. Uh, but actually, this secretly contributes to the variation of action at linear order once we integrate because there is a logarithmic divergence when we set epsilon to zero. Um, that really means we should keep track of all the powers of rho to the epsilon from other part of the integrand before doing the integral. And with those powers, this integral will be a convergent. At rho equals zero, it will no longer be divergent if this number is positive. And this number actually and, and, the, and the final result is actually some one over epsilon. So it enhances uh, something which is quadratic in epsilon into a linear contribution. And entanglement entropy picks up that linear contribution at the end of the day. So this is very much similar. This one over epsilon kind of pose is, is very similar to uh, the same kind of pose in dimensional regularization where epsilon is, for example, 4 minus d. It's the same story. And really, in order to compute um, in general, what is the right uh, size of the contribution? It's easiest to use uh, what I call the regularized cone method. Uh, some, some people call it regularized squashed, squashed cone, just to make to emphasize that the cone is not U1 symmetric. Um, so the the idea is we are we are looking at um, a, the action of a conical geometry with a tip cut off. Remember, I don't want to consider any contribution from the tip. So I can fill in, let's fill in the tip by some regular geometry and subtract it off. This is always true. And then I can, uh, I claim that the total action of this um, geometry without boundary uh, has zero derivative at epsilon equals zero. This is because I'm varying, epsilon equals zero is the n equals one solution. It's a sol solution of all equations of motion and, and since the entire thing is regularized and has no boundary, <coughs> there is no there is no linear contribution to the to the uh, to the variation of the action. The variation of the action is completely proportional to the equation of motion, which is satisfied. So therefore, I, therefore the entanglement entropy, which is the epsilon derivative of the outside action, is just minus the derivative of the inside action. Just to be clear, I mean, there are boundaries at infinity. Yes. The, you include the usual boundary terms. Yes, the usual Gibbons Hawking bound, the usual Gibbons Hawking York, York bound, yeah. yeah. Okay. The boundary term is there to get rid of the to get rid of the boundary term there. Yes. Okay. 
you're just not you're not including it for the conical. Yes, yeah. And it's important that when we do this derivative, the UV bound the, the the boundary condition at the asymptotic UV of ADS is held fixed. So we are not incurring any additional boundary terms from there. This can be worked out in a very precise way. So the only contribution, so therefore it is, it is um, from this procedure it is clear that the only contribution to the entanglement entropy is localized at the conical defect. It's minus the derivative of the action from the inside of this cone geometry. Um, this is rather analogous to how we use counterterms to deduce Brown anomaly. One should think about one can think about this as the um, uh, as the renormalized effective action. This is the counterterm, and this is the total effective action. But this is another story. There's a there's analogy to how we how we use the outside inside to compute uh, this entanglement entropy, and in the Brown anomaly calculation, there is a similar story where. We, we use the same technique to analyze the effective action and counterterm. And it is also clear because log, logarithmic diverge, divergences are robust. Um, this kind of, uh, we can actually use any regulator we want. It doesn't, the final result does not depend on the regulator. Uh, so we, we can just pick our simplest regulator like putting an A in front of the warp factor. And this already, smooth out the interior geometry and we can do the computation. So we can just do the computation and it's very clear that uh, there are two kinds of contrib contributions. Uh, there is one possible contribution if one Riemann tensor gives a delta function or in this case a regularized version of a delta function smeared in, in the inside of the cone and the integral of that just picks up the coefficient of the, this component of the Riemann tensor. So in this in this example, it just picks up this term. And this is exactly the word entropy. And there's another, as we said, there's another possibility of getting a linear term if we have a log divergence. At least a log divergence when, as, when, when you set epsilon to zero <coughs> prematurely. And one can compute this in a very explicit way. I won't repeat that. Um, and the final result uh, will be something uh, which, 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 uh, which precisely agrees with an earlier explicit co computation uh, by these people. And where they did the calculation in a, in a rather explicit way where they actually write down a particular metric with transfer space being cylinders or spheres and so on, and then fix the coefficient by computing the whole thing at arbitrary n and then analytically continue. So it's, it's a much more complicated than calculation that I'm doing what I'm doing here. And, and it's nice to see this computation because it captures where the contribution is coming from. So I won't, re I won't really uh, try to completely derive the formula. It's, it's rather easy to see that one now generally picks up, for the delta function, one just pick up the derivative of, of the Lagrangian and for the, for, the, for the second kind of contribution in general, one pick up, uh, one, needs, one needs a Riemann tensor that goes like zi, zj, and the other goes like its conjugate, and we simply take a second derivative of the, of the Lagrangian. Um, so there is, a, there, is a, there is a bit of um, counting, there is a counting parameter involved which counts how many extra powers of rho to the two epsilon that appears in the second derivative of L. This is because, because we have a log divergence and any powers of rho to the epsilon is important. We need to keep track of all of them. So in the conical geometry, we, we, want, we, we can actually expand in a lot of uh, different components of the Riemann tensors. And for example, different components or different terms inside could have different powers of rho to the two epsilon because these factors appear in the metric. And one should, I should actually count those. And the idea is we should, we should expand this quantity for each different term which, com which with comes different, with, for each term which comes with different powers of rho to the two epsilon, Q uh, counts the, power, the extra number of those factors. And then we resum use the weight, um, uh, uh, use basically one over Q alpha plus one for the weight. One comes from 
the, uh, the power, there is already a row to the two epsilon coming from the determinant of the metric and as well as these two factors. So it's just some counting, something, some counting that one needs to keep track of. And uh, for the sake of time, I, I won't go through the detailed prescription. There is a very explicit description, prescription for how to do the counting uh, because one can do a, a, a Gauss-Gadazi-like decomposition for, for different components of the Riemann tensor. And, and it turns out that uh, the extrinsic curvature terms usually comes with different powers of rho to the two epsilon. And at the end of the day, you can just do this kind of decomposition and count the different terms that you have in each, in each term. So this is something that can be done very explicitly for a given theory. For example, if you give me a Lagrangian, this is something which can be done very, very efficiently. Uh, and in particular, one doesn't really need to know what these R tildes are. Um, uh, one can write it out. It's not necessary for this purpose. If, for example, if you want your final result to be written in terms of the Riemann tensor and and um, and the extrinsic curvature, because what you do is you 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 take you take possible components of the Riemann tensor in the second derivative of L, you decompose, and then you resum, use the weights, and then you can replace R tilde using this equation again and get some a final result, which is, which is nice. So you don't really need to know what it is, although it, 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 you can write it down explicitly. And, and in some sense, these Q alphas can be thought of as very loosely as, as anomaly coefficients. So, so Q alpha is not just simply related to the power of the curvature that appears in the action? No, it's not. For different terms, you get different. For example, let's consider this example. This is a Riemann tensor with all components along the 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 the, yeah, the mid your action is coherent, right? It, it yeah. can't involve only certain components in the Riemann tensor. It always involves all components. Yeah, so that's right. So you should uh, the prescription is you should write it out, expand it out, and with each term you might associate different <coughs> different cues. So so the idea so a very uh, um, a very a very um, a very brute force way of doing this is you first figure out what this is, and then you expand out all, all the contractions. So um, you, for example, if there's a contract, uh, contracted index, you can either be in the i direction or a direction, where you have two type of directions, and you use these equations and figure out what the, for each term, for each term which is a sub, so, so you get the, then you get a sum of products of different terms like this, and for each term, now you can assign Q by counting how many guys there are in, in that term. And then you sum over alpha, where alpha counts different terms. So this is, this is in principle, this can be done. Um, and this is actually the right prescription for lab log gravity. And it's very sensitive to all these powers. In particular, if you look at this term, it is, it is the intrinsic curvature plus products of two extrinsic curvatures and it turns out this term does not come from, does not come with any powers of rho. This this term comes with uh, powers of rho to the two epsilon. So you actually have uh, q equals one for this term and q equals zero for that term. This is the this is a this is the one example of how we count uh, different weights of the different terms. So uh, we can now compare it with existing results. For f of r gravity, it is, tri it is sort of trivial. There is no anomaly, just the Watts entropy. And we can see it uh, by transforming it trivially to Einstein gravity plus scalar fields. Um, there's, uh, one can immediately use it for four derivative gravity, where the general form of the Lagrangian is like this. And using the formula, one immediately works, works out something, something which agrees with also some with, with, with this paper. So the um, lab log gravity at four derivative is just, uh, which is also Gauss-Binet gravity, is a special example of the previous one. And it, it, uh, the, all the terms sums into the extreme of, in terms of the intrinsic curvature of the co-dimension, of the co-dimension two surface. It agrees with Jacobson-Myers entropy. At six derivatives, um, 
there is no prior derivation uh, for this. There is a conjecture that it also might also be Jackson, Jackson Myers, but it's just a conjecture. There is partial consistent check in this formula in, in this paper. Uh, miraculously, our formula also gives the same Jackson Myers entropy. Um, and actually, in general, level of gravity, one can prove it. Um, one can prove that the formula is always the Jackson Myers entropy. And remember that Jackson Myers entropy is if you write the love Lagrangian as uh, this generalized delta function where all the upper and lower indices are anti-symmetrized, then the Jackson Myers entropy is simply um, uh, the p minus one of these guys with with the intrinsic curvature instead of the extrinsic with, instead of the original curvature. So one can show this. This is sensitive to uh, all those weights I talk about. So it's a quite non-trivial check. So um, we we used um, we used the uh, um, we used the generalized um, uh, gravitational entropy method to de de derive something uh, which which is valid for higher derivative gravity, and we use uh, so we it's important that uh, we have to keep track of uh, quadratic terms in the in the in the Lagrangian if there could be a logarithmic divergence at epsilon equals zero. This is the main uh, this is the main point of, of my talk, and it agrees with um, uh, existing results. There is a caveat in in how we count this component of the of the um, in this possible expansion, remember Q is the derivative of K. So K appears <coughs> linearly in the expansion of the metric. Q is a quadratic order. Um, there, there, we, we made a particular, I just want to say brief, say very quickly that we made a particular but very natural assumption about the analytic continuation from the ZN symmetric metric to non integer N. But it would be nice to fix this um, more concretely. I think. Uh, uh, if, if you are interested, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. So, could you remind us what the um, Myers Jacobson description is? Yeah, yeah it, it is this. That's for Lovelock, right? It is always for Lovelock. It's only for oh, it's just Jefferson, for yeah, Jefferson Myers can only be applied for Lovelock. So, they didn't have a, they, unfortunately, they don't have anything for, for non Lovelock theory. It, so it looks like you could. Their yes. Their yes. So the, uh, the yes, precisely. Uh, the formula completely reproduces that in the case of Lovelock gravity. And how did they come up with this? They they use this they use a Hamiltonian formalism because the Lovelock gravity has the uh, interesting feature that that the equation is second order. So one can use the Hamiltonian formalism and uh, and derive uh, derive this, use the second law basically use derive something which, which, which applies, which obeys the second law. Oh, you mean the first law? Uh, yeah, uh, well, um, yeah, possible, possible. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah, possible, yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 and I have a uh, paper where we proved the second law for ethyl blah, blah, yes. that was later, yeah. and, um, and you haven't mentioned it, but it exists. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, uh, yes. There is a proposal by by, by Aaron about uh, how to how to do the, what is the generalization of the Jacobson Myers to the case where the theory is not just Lovelock but f of Lovelock. So any function of Lovelock, the Lovelock Lagrangian is this. So any function of this, and and uh, my formula actually agrees with their results. So it's this, this comes after I submitted the paper, so I was happy. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, so I'll just br very briefly talk about how to evaluate, how to, how to, the minimization um, because in the sake of time. So um, maybe I started five minutes after. Um, so so um, the, the idea is the, the location that we should evaluate this formula is in, in principle well defined. It is in principle well defined because one can evaluate, one can, one can, one can solve the equation of motion, figure out where the conical defect is, um, 
and then analytically continue, and then and then take the limits and goes to one. So in principle, you can you can you can define it that way. But this is hard. This is difficult to find out, and it's not efficient. So it's 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 very desirable to to be able to find the location of the conical defect as n goes to one by some other way. In particular, it'd be nice if it's it can be determined from minimizing some function. Um, in the cosmic brain method, we can ask a similar question. What is the cosmic brain action which produces the right conical defect in the theory of higher derivative gravity? This is the equivalent question. Once we find that, then minimizing that automatically gives the conical defect. So in particular, we can ask, can this simply be the same formula that we, came, we saw earlier? And um, we will see that by example. So in f of log gravity, this is again a sort of trivial example because we can transform to Einstein gravity a plus scalar field, and this 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 indeed gives the right this indeed indeed gives the right minimizing this gives the right uh, the surface uh, for 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 we to use this formula. There's a way to see this from the cosmic brain method where we simply combine the um, uh, this this action with with the brain action. Uh, where the brain action is simply the entanglement entropy, and we show that this gives the right conical defect. The way we show that is we look at the most singular terms in the equation of motion, and the most singular term is in the conical geometry is expected to be that one of the Riemann tensor contributes a delta function. So this is the equation, and one of these guys can contribute the delta function, and we can simply we can simply we can simply match the delta function in some sense. And, and get and set and and and, and derive the um, uh, derive the conical defect. So so in general, this is this is this is this could be a strategy for deriving the cosmic brain uh, action for for a general theory of high derivative gravity. In this case, it's particularly simple because everything is just a Ricci scale. Um, for general four derivative gravity, one can also do this. Um, so this is the Lagrangian as we saw earlier, and this is the entanglement entropy. We can also show this use the cosmic brain method. There is, um, instead of going through the derivation, I just show how the extrinsic curvature terms comes out. Um, so um, the extrinsic curvature comes out because, because it, it, it actually is very similar to the previous derivation, but, but arises in a slightly different way. So we can, we can consider the equation of mo there, there's a term in the equation of motion which looks like this. Because one can have one of the Riemann tensor produces two derivative x on the other Riemann tensor, where the other Riemann tensor actually has this structure for these components. And then we actually have three derivatives acting on A. And it produces, it produces a single derivative on the delta function. So this delta function comes not from a single Riemann tensor which already produces a delta function, but from additional derivatives that acts on it. And, and, and the extrinsic curvature precisely produces, when they arise in the equation of motion, when, when they are put in the brain action, they, they gives an equation of motion which is precisely of this form. So one can just match, one can also match them in order to convince yourself that this is the right cosmic brain method, uh, brain action. In Lovelock gravity, it is, it is actually quite simple now because equation of motion is second derivative. We can actually use both methods. Um, the cosmic brain method uh, it, um, is, is much simpler because there is no derivative acting on delta functions anymore. One can just uh, check all the delta, one can just simply check coefficients of delta function without worrying about its derivatives. And this actually explains why the, why the jackson myers entropy does not depend on the um, intrinsic, the extrinsic, the extrinsic data. It only depends on the intrinsic um, um, uh, Riemann, uh, Ricci, uh, Riemann tensor. Uh, this, be, this is because if it had depended on something extrinsic, it would necessarily um, produce a delta a derivative acting on the delta function, which cannot possibly be matched by the equation of motion in the, origin, in the original theory. So it sort of explains why this has to be the case. 
in the boundary condition method, it's actually a straightforward generalization of something that was done in August where they considered uh, bus bus net gravity. So the idea is you simply look at, again, the component of the equation of motion. And uh, because of the anti-symmetrized property of the, this generalized delta function, one immediately see that there is a component which is potentially diverging as you approach the conical defect and imposing that the coefficient be zero is in the embedding equation for, for minimizing um, for minimizing the jefferson myers entropy. So one can work this out very, very explicitly. So um, yeah, let me, let me conclude. Uh, there is um, uh, the main point of the talk is there is a, there's a formula that, that when we evaluate on the conical defect defined as C1, it can give the holographic entanglement entropy for general high derivative gravity. And it consists of two terms and it has very nice physical meanings. It agrees with existing results, and also in three examples, we've shown that it, replay, it act, minimizing the action gives the location of the, of the conical defect. There is immediately a lot of open questions. Uh, one, it would be nice if we can show that minimizing the entanglement entropy always gives the conical defect. Um, so I've shown it for three examples, but, but it would be nice that this is always true. Even if this is not true, one can find perhaps other efficient ways for locating the conical defect. Maybe but one can always look at singular components of the equation of motion. And my, my, my opinion is that they, by looking at the right components, one can always extract the data to fix the location, although this might, they, they, they may or may not arise as minimization of some functional. But, but that's, for practical purposes at least, that's good enough because how do we use the minimization procedure? We go ahead and derive the embedding equation and solving them anyway. So if we arrive at some equation which determines the location, for practical purposes, we don't really care. Um, and it's nice, it would be nice to generalize the formula to other cases where, for example, we have derivative of the Riemann tensor in the Lagrangian, which I haven't <laughs> talked about. Um, this. I think in this case, one just needs more bookkeeping because derivatives hitting on the Riemann tensor basically asks you, uh, you, in order to do that, one needs to expand the Riemann tensor to higher orders in the terms of, uh, uh, in, in the expansion of the metric. So one needs to work more systematically, but, but I think the idea is still true that one can go through the different terms in the Lagrangian and pick up those which either have a delta function or has the possible log divergences. It's always the log divergences which can, can be enhanced into a linear contribution. So, and also TMG, the topologically massive gravity is another possible generalization. Um, there's application to entanglement entropy in 60 dimensional CFTs, uh, which, which I'm thinking about. There is also, um, I think there is also a lot of applications in black hole physics, which I want to think about either. And uh, eventually, maybe, I don't know if, that, if there's anything useful we can say about one loop corrections, maybe there is. Um, and eventually, we may want to covariantize this formula into a version where we can consider general time dependent case. One can, for root Takanagi formula, one, there, is a, there, is a, there is a proposal that we can always just extremize the area um, in the Lorenzian background. One can perhaps do something. Uh, I think it's uh, one can naturally conjecture that 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 um, that extremizing some this this formula could also give the right thing. But I'm not. I'm, I haven't thought about that more than, um, in more details. So so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Geometric meaning, you mean uh, other than the fact that it is, it is, it is con constructed from the Riemann and the extrinsic curvature? Um, I mean, you started, you're generalizing the area. Yeah. The area is not. Yeah, for a particular theory, it has, well, it sort of has geometric meaning. 
for example, for the Jackson Myers entropy, it has a geometric meaning in terms of the intrinsic data on the, sur on the surface. And in particular examples, one can see that, for example, this term is some Riemann tensor, or this term is some extrinsic data. But in general, I, I, I don't have a good um, one sentence summary of what geometric meaning is, other than saying this is in general Riemann contractions of Riemann tensor and case. Do you know if your formula is positive definite? Um, it's not clear. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the short answer to that question is uh, one, in order to, uh, one can first always add this to the root Takanagi formula, which means uh, I always consider small perturbation from Einstein gravity by adding some higher derivative term with small coefficients to Einstein gravity. In that case, it is guaranteed to be positive definite from a perturbative sense. Um, and when those coefficients, those coupling constants become large, uh, I don't have a, a, a positive definite proof of this. And I don't really think there is, because in general, you might expect problems such as ghosts. So, so you might expect that you only can really get um, um, unitary theory when, when those couplings are very special. And, and my, con my conjecture is that when they do, when they admit something unitary, you can, you can probably show that this is this well, positive. And, and also, at least from the point of view of string theory, no re reason to neglect the derivative of Precisely, precisely. That's why I wanted to, I w I want to generalize it to, to the derivative case. Yeah, so, so the idea is if we do look at full string theory, we have to include all those. Once we do that, we get something which is perhaps not perturbatively, not perturbatively correct in alpha prime. Obviously, it's negative for GR with a negative Newton constant, so there has to be some constraint. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. <laughs> yes. um, so in the normal Takanagi formula, the fact that you minimize something is yeah. sort of nice because it implies strong subadditivity. Yes, yes. Immediately. So yes. Um, does that make you think that maybe you minimize something here too, or do you think strong subadditivity? That's the main. That's the main motivation for thinking about why 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 minimizing this could be the right answer in the first place. Um, but uh, there there are two ways to to think there may be, it's not a huge problem if if it doesn't really minimize the the formula. One one first first thing is that. Again, without a particular structure of these higher derivative terms, there could be ghosts, and strong subadditivity does not necessarily hold. So you might expect that uh, this doesn't always hold. It's nice that this holds in unitary theory, such as Jack, such as the Lovelock theory, where it's second derivative, and also f of r, where it's trivially second derivative. Um, and and I think maybe this. Maybe the difficulty in improving a minimization prescription in general is related to the fact that there could be ghosts, and the theory knows about that. There is another more technical answer, which is if you, even if you had some minimization prescription, as Aaron reminded me yesterday, there could be, there, there, in the, in the, in the, in the proof of strong subadditivity, you basically look at two minimal surfaces, you look at two surfaces which intersect, and then you pull them apart. And in replacing those, in smoothing out that thing, uh, the extrinsic curvature could, in principle, come in and make a difference. So, so in the Einstein gravity case, that doesn't matter, and you can immediately prove it. But in, in general, you, there's some subtlety. Again, you might expect those particular theories, you might still be able to do it. But in general, I don't have a, I don't, I, I don't have a concrete answer yet.